Welcome, everybody. Glad you could be here this morning, uh, whether you're joining us in person or online. We're glad you're here. Uh, I have really, really enjoyed uh, being able to uh, talk about power from the book of Acts. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We've hit on a lot of different themes and ideas, and we're going to be continuing right along in that same vein. Uh, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 10 today. Uh, the last time I, I preached was on Acts chapter 8, and we were talking about uh, the power of God to heal. And we talked about how there were different things, different ways that God healed in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 is about Philip going into Samaria and bringing the gospel there. And we saw like immediate healings, right? Uh, Philip was healing people who can walk. He was also uh, driving out demons. So there were immediate healings that were happening right away. But there were also some healings that were taking a little bit more time, right? Like with Simon the sorcerer who uh, became a convert, became a disciple of Jesus. He was, he was following Philip around, wanting to learn more and more about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, what it meant to be a disciple, learning and absorbing about the kingdom of God and trying to learn about it. Um, but there was a sin problem. He was still captive to sin. You remember he, Peter and John come to Samaria and they start uh, pouring out the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands and so Simon thinks he can buy that gift and uh, Peter had some very blunt things to tell Philip that he's captive to sin that he's captive to bitterness that he needs to repent and find freedom and Simon does but we also talked about a healing that took a little bit more time the healing the healing that happened with Peter and Peter and John, who the last time they'd been in Samaria, they wanted to see the place burn to the ground in Luke chapter 9. And then uh, they go into Samaria, not preaching or teaching, which is very different approach to things. All through the book of Acts, everywhere the apostles are going, it talks about them preaching and teaching, but they don't do it when they go into Samaria. But they do it as they leave Samaria, indicating that something happens. There's a shift happened. When they saw the Holy Spirit coming out on the Samaritans, Peter and John were convinced, okay, they, they're part of the kingdom now too. So they go and they preach and teach as they're leaving Samaria. It's this healing that takes a little bit longer um, that we're going to focus on today. Uh, Acts chapter 10 does a really good job of kind of walking us through what healing that take, that's a process looks like, what it can look like uh, through the story of Peter and Cornelius. We're jumping over Acts chapter 9, which is a really great chapter. It's the story of Saul converting, right? Uh, he moves from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And... Uh, Saul, uh, it's a great story. I encourage you to read it on your own. It has some really cool things to say about God and power and reinforces a lot of what we've already learned and heard. Uh, but let's jump into Acts chapter 10 now. We're gonna kick off with the first verse. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now said men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. We're going to pause here for a moment. There's a lot of details that Luke gives us in this passage. Uh, first, he, he taught, caught, I love his description of Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion. So this is like, this is like a general. This is like a head of a legion. This is, this is a guy up, up in the top ranks of the Roman military. And Cornelius, but he, he describes Cornelius as a devout and, and God-fearer. This is what uh, the Bible refers to as a God-fearer. A God-fearer is a Gentile who commits to following the God of the Jews. So he doesn't embrace Jewish culture completely, but is still committed to the worship of their God. We have lots of examples of God-fearers in the Bible. Uh, Naaman the leper, he was a guy who got healed by the prophet Elisha. He would have been a God-fearer. He goes back to his pagan nation and takes a barrel of dirt with him so that as he's being forced to kneel in the temple of his 
pagan gods, he can be kneeling on God's land, on God's soil, and pray to the God who healed him as opposed to his pagan gods. Uh, David, uh, King David had 50 fighting men, and among those 50 fighting men are a bunch of Gentiles that are listed. Uriah the Hittite is one of those Gentiles who's listed as one of the uh, fighting men. He was a God-fearer, somebody who didn't embrace Jewish culture but still embraced the worship of God. And that's how Cornelius is being described here. So he's committed to God. Him and his entire household, they're devoted, they're committed to God, they're praying to God regularly, they're giving to the poor. And then he gets a vision, right? And this vision is this angel that appears. So we're seeing God beginning to open the doors of communication to uh, do something for Cornelius. And I love how the angel begins. Is the angel is actually quoting some Old Testament here. When he talks about your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering to God. This idea of this memorial offering to God is a picture of prayer in the Old Testament. In Psalm 141, it talks about the prayer of the righteous being an incense offering, a memorial offering that goes up to God in the heavens. And the, and the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Amos, Malachi, uh, Jeremiah, they all refer to offerings of God as memorial offerings, incense offerings, and those offerings are the prayer that's good and pleasing to God and caring for the needs of the community, the needs of the people around them, which is exactly what Cornelius is doing. And so the angel kicks off with an exhort exhortation derived from scripture to basically say like, God loves you, man, he, you're in. He, he, has, he wants to show you favor, but you're missing, you're missing part of the story. You need to go fetch a guy by the name of Peter who's in a city called Joppa. Joppa is about a full day's journey away from Caesarea. And it got me wondering, why, why, that, that's not really that close. Right? Joppa is a coastal city. Caesarea is a coastal city as well. Joppa is just south of Caesarea. And uh, there had to have been other believers nearby. Why, why pick Peter? Um, I mean, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, or not Ananias and Sapphira, the story of Paul's conversion, there's a man named Ananias, different Ananias, uh, who lives in Damascus. Uh, right? He's a Jewish convert who's been displaced. And Damascus is even further north than Caesarea. Uh, when the persecution breaks out against the church in Jerusalem, the Jews start going all over the place and they found churches in Antioch, which is even farther than Caesarea. So surely there would have been somebody local God could have sent to Caesarea, to the home of Cornelius. Why send Peter? Not only that, but Luke actually affirms that, that there was somebody local who could have gone to Cornelius' side. Somebody who had actually worked with Gentile peoples before and helping them understand God. His name was Philip. At the end of Acts chapter 8, we're told that after Philip does his thing with the Ethiopian eunuch, where it helps him uh, embrace saving faith and get baptized, he gets teleported to a city called Azotus. And Azotus is a half a day's uh, journey from Joppa. So it's just a little bit further south yet. And he travels all the way up, do you know where? Caesarea. The very city where Cornelius is. And there's nothing in the book of Acts that indicates that Philip ever left. In fact, at the end of Acts, Philip meets with Paul before he's gonna get arrested and taken to Rome. And we're told that he had four prophetess daughters. He raised a family in Caesarea. So Philip was likely there and knew how to connect with Gentiles. He knew that God had a vision to bring Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Philip was, would have been ready, would have gone. But he doesn't call Philip, he calls Peter. He wants Peter to go makes me think that there's something that God wants to do in Peter because as we saw uh, at the beginning of the month with Peter and John, often when God wants us to get involved in people's lives, it's not just for the benefit of the people that we're serving, it's also for our benefit and God wants to do a work in us as we work with the people he's placed in our lives. And so there's likely something that God is gonna work on in Peter. That's why God wants Peter to be the one to go to Cornelius. And sure enough, uh, in verse nine, we read that Peter is praying the, and these servants from Cornelius are heading there. They're on their way. So let's see what happens. Let's see how God gets Peter's attention. Verse 10, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let, uh, being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill 
and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that, you, so that he could hear what you have to say. Let's pause there. I love the role that prayer plays in this, <laughs> in this passage. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a little bit of a thread that runs through Luke's gospel and spills into the book of Acts because Luke wrote both. Just the importance of prayer, that there's not actually a fixed time to pray. <laughs> you just have to pray. You know, you've got examples of people praying all night. You've got people, examples of people praying at, uh, in the evening, in the morning. P- Peter here, he's praying at the noon hour. You've got examples of people praying in crowds, examples of people praying on their own. It's almost like Luke just wants us to get it. You just got to pray. <laughs> you got to be a people that prays. And in fact, all the miraculous things that God is doing in this text have to do with prayer, have to do with communication, have to do with not only speaking to God, but actively listening and hearing him. This is a story chock full of the communication of God. In fact, there are five ways, five ways that I counted that God communicates just in these verses that we read. And he's gonna communicate in a few more more ways by the end of the chapter. But look at Cornelius, right? You've got a vision, he gets a vision, and there's an angel. So there's an angelic messenger speaking and dialoguing with Cornelius as he's praying, right? So if we want to encounter the healing of God, if we, if, we want to, if, we want to, if we want to receive God's healing, prayer has to be something we develop in our lives. And then through this vision, this angel that appears and begins speaking and dialoguing with Cornelius, we've also got that within the message, in that message, there's scripture being used, Right? The angel uses scripture to exhort Cornelius, an Old Testament picture of of what a proper sacrifice to God looks like. What does a good incense offering, a good memorial offering, what does it entail? Praying well and giving to the poor, and Cornelius is doing both. So God is using visions, an angel. He uses scripture itself to communicate truth. Then with Peter, right, he, he gets a vision as well, a vision that he's able to dialogue with, and, and I love what Peter does with that vision because he kind of sits on it. He doesn't act on it right away, right? He gets this vision of all these animals, that all kinds of animals, and he's kind of hungry. I, this is one of those stories where you kind of get a sense of the playfulness of God, right? Because he's hungry, and that's what God uses to get his attention. Okay, you're hungry, good. I gotcha. We'll, we'll, we'll snag your, we'll catch, we'll catch your attention. Go and eat, Peter. Have your fill, Right? And Peter's like, I, no, 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 I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. I'm not doing that, right? Because the Jews had very strict laws on what you could and couldn't eat. It, the criteria boiled down to two things, cleft hoof and it had to chew cud, right? Those were the two, two kinds of an, land animals you could eat. If it had a cleft hoof and you could chew cud. Horses, you could not eat even though they chewed cud because they don't have a cleft foot, hoof. Neither do camels. Pigs have a cleft hoof, but they don't eat cud. So you, you don't, you know, they eat everything. So you don't eat pigs. That's why sheep are okay. Cows are okay. That's about it when it comes to land animals. Um, so there's strict laws. And, and Peter's like panicking, right? You can almost feel the, the anxiousness. Surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean, impure or unclean. And God three times reaffirms, don't call anything unclean or impure that I have made clean, that God has made clean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Three times the vision hits him. And and Peter could have, when the vision was over, right, Peter could have turned to the kitchen, to the people preparing the meal and said, okay, God said we could eat whatever we want, pull out the bacon. But he doesn't do that. He sits with the vision. He doesn't act on it right away. He's mulling it over. What could this mean? This can't be about food, could it? Like, what is going on with this vision? 
What's happening here? And while he's in this process of thinking and dialoguing and processing the vision, that's when God speaks a fourth way through a prompting of the Spirit in verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, uh, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Uh, Oh, yeah, and then, sorry, verse 19, not 17. Lost my spot. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. While Peter was thinking about the vision, while he's trying to understand it, the Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks. And it could have been an audible voice, but given the fact that Peter's in the midst of thinking about the vision, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. I think the Spirit impressed a thought, left an impression upon him, inserted an idea that was not coming from Peter. I don't know if, that's, if that rings any bells with you at all. If you've ever been deep in thought and all of a sudden a, vision, a thought seems to come out of left field and you're just like, where did that come from? It, was, it could have been the Spirit of God speaking to you. So we've got impressions, we've got thoughts, and the thought is helping Peter get some clarity on what the vision means. Not only that, but there's a fit, the fifth way that God speaks is through people. Right? The three men who are looking for Peter, they come and they say, there's this guy named Cornelius. Now, he's a Roman centurion. And I can only imagine what these three guys were feeling because they probably knew some of the strict uh, laws that were around Jews. They're from, they seem to be fairly familiar with how Jews operate in the world and that they separate themselves from Gentiles because they don't want to become unclean. We'll be talking about more of that in a minute. And so they almost have this whole spiel. He's righteous. He's a God-fearing man. He's respected by the Jewish community. You don't need to fear this guy. Come out. There's an angel who appeared to him and said that you have a message for him, right? So we got the, we've got a community. We've got people communicating the messages of God. So God is spe- speaks just in five ways in 22 verses. Five different ways. Visions, angels, scriptures, impressions and thoughts and people. This has something important to tell us. As we engage with God, as we seek to discern his spirit and the way that he speaks and the way that he moves, we need to make sure that um, we don't go rogue (laughs) with the thoughts and the impressions of God. We weigh and measure them. We compare them with the other ways that God communicates. We, 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 commute, we bring it to other people. We get them involved in helping us discern the things God is saying. We go to scripture. We use that as a lens to understand the things God is saying. You don't go rogue with this stuff. Peter doesn't. Peter doesn't. He takes time. He seeks to try to understand it. And as he's engaging with it, God begins speaking more to him about the things that God does. I don't think this would have been um, something that Peter would have been able to do on day one. This is something that took time. This is something Peter had to cultivate in his life, learning how to hear from God, learning to discern him, learning how to pray well. And as he does, there's other forms of communication that begin opening up in his life. God starts using other ways and other methods once Peter gets really good at discerning the voice of God. But he begs the question, why impure and unclean? That seems, that's what the vision is all about. What, did, what things that are impure and God is cleaning them up. What does that have to do with any of this? What, what is that, the, why is that the first thing that God says to Peter? Well, I think it's because God wants to heal something in Peter's life. Let's go on and, and, and continue reading just a little bit more. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. And while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Let's pause here for a moment. Because Peter has made the connection for us between the vision and what God is seeking to heal in his life. 
Peter is seeing some people as impure and unclean, people that God has cleaned up. You see, the Jewish law at this time, by, by the time of the first century, was very, 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 very strict. Um, you, they had taken all of the cleanliness laws and just blown them up. And they were so concerned that people remain pure that they, made, they outlawed, they made it impossible for people, for Jews to even associate with Gentiles. You, you couldn't even have like a decent, con- you weren't even supposed to have a decent conversation with them. You were supposed to withdraw. You weren't supposed to share a meal with them. You're, you weren't supposed to invite them into, ha- into your house. You weren't supposed to go into their house. You had to separate from them as much as you could if you wanted to remain clean, if you wanted to remain in good standing with God the Father. More on that in a moment. And Peter seemed to be living his life this way. Even the guys who go with him from Joppa are Jewish believers, right? And uh, and, and he seems to be living in isolation. But what what is he doing in Joppa then? Well, remember, the the church is spreading outside of Jerusalem. And I I think Peter may have been doing something that... um, that is familiar to our denomination. It's how our denomination got its start. Itinerant preaching ministry, right? Where lay people would go out and preach and teach and make sure that other people understood the gospel. And I think, I think Peter's doing a bit of that. He's, he's, he's checking out the Jewish church outside Jerusalem and he's making sure that it's doing okay and it's growing well. But as he's doing that, he's avoiding Gentiles. And, and by his own confession, he says, it's against the law for me to be here. It's against the law for me to bring you into my house, even though he just did that with the servants who came and visited him, visited him the day before, as well as for him to go into their house. He shouldn't be doing either of those things. And yet, and yet God reveals something to him, that somehow God has made these people pure, and he should not call them impure if God has cleaned them up. He shouldn't call them impure if God has cleaned them up. That's what the vision was all about. God has, is beginning a work to clean up the Gentiles. They're not impure anymore. They can be embraced as part of the people of God. I don't, I, and I think that this was, I mean, for us in chapter 10, this is a moment. And it seems like this is something that happened very quickly in Peter's life. But I think when we take a, when we take a step back and look at all of what Luke has written in the book of Luke and the book of Acts, we start realizing that that wasn't the case at all. In fact, this actually started right with Jesus' ministry in the book of Luke. The book of Luke makes it very, very clear that Luke, that Jesus had just an active ministry among Gentiles as he did among Jews. He took, uh, he took Peter and the other disciples uh, to the Decapolis at one point, which was the remnants of the uh, Canaanite peoples. And he took them there, he took them across the lake to go see the Decapolis to face off against a demon-possessed man, a man who was plagued by an entire legion of demons, a Gentile man. And Jesus took them to wage war against this guy to show them God is here for this kingdom too. God has come for Gentiles as well. And he heals them and then they leave. But they don't, they don't, it's not just a one and done thing. They go back. They go back to the Decapolis and they provide healings and they do teachings and they do miracles. And then they leave and then they come back to the Decapolis and they feed 4,000 Gentiles. 4,000 Gentiles. There's a feeding of 5,000 Jews and 4,000 Gentiles. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke, uh, Jesus actually has more positive things to say about the faith of Gentiles than he does about Jews. He, He lays into the Jewish faith several times, but he commends the faith of Gentiles. Probably one of the most striking examples is a Roman centurion who sends word to Jesus, hey, I've got a sick servant, can you come heal him? And so uh, Jesus decides, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. Maybe it was Cornelius, we don't know. We don't know. Um, but Jesus says, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll heal him. And he, as he's on his way, a, a second servant comes and says, you know what, my master has decided you don't need to come. You say the word, this guy will be healed. You don't need to be here. I, I, he is able, capable of commanding soldiers without having to be in their presence and, and he believes that you can do the same thing in this situation. And Jesus commends his faith. Wow, I haven't seen any faith like this in anywhere in all of Israel. And Peter's here sitting there listening to those words. The Gentiles have a better faith than the Jews. <laughs> and Jesus ministered with Peter in that way for three years Three years working with Jews and Gentiles and trying to get Peter to see, hey, 
They're, I want them part of my kingdom too. In fact, in the book of Acts, that was the last exhortation Jesus gave before he, is, before he ascended. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. That didn't mean the Jewish world. That meant everywhere, Gentiles too. But Peter's been staying in Jerusalem. I wanted to make sure that my numbers were right on this, so I did a lot of research just making sure that uh, I, I was remembering this properly. Um, but we, they figure that between chapter 10 and chapter one in the book of Acts took an average of nine to 12 years. Think about that, nine to 12 years. You add the three years of Jesus's ministry and that means that Peter was working, that God was working on this thing of, Je- of Peter accepting the Gentiles into the people of God for an average of 12 to 15 years. And we don't know what was going on in his life prior to Jesus working with Peter directly, face to face. 12 to 15 years before Peter finally got it. Okay, God can make them clean too. They can be part of the kingdom. It was a process. This wasn't just something that happened overnight. There are things in your life and my life that God wants to heal and it's going to take a process. God is going to adjust and fix them and heal them by degrees and every once in a while we'll have a big moment like this where God comes crashing down onto the scene and says, okay, we need to have a talk. (laughs) But it's gonna happen after years of God working, working, working gently calling us, calling us to a different way of doing things, to a different life. But you see, the cleanliness and uncleanliness thing was just a small part of it. There's actually something possibly more sinister going on with Peter, and Peter confesses it. You see, Cornelius goes on to tell Peter what we already know. An angel showed up, told me to come get you, so I sent for you, verses 30 to 33, and he tells him everything that we've already looked at. And then Peter starts preaching. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Did you catch what he said? I now know it's true that God doesn't show favoritism. What does that mean? I now know it's true that I can't make God love me more. That's essentially what favoritism is. It's believing that you can get somebody to love you more based on what you do, right? And, and it took Peter 15 years for him to get that, that God, he can't actually increase the God, God's love for him. It's too big, it's too vast, it's too overwhelming. You can't increase it. We talk about this all the time, but we talk about it from the other perspective. We talk about how God, we can't do anything to decrease God's love, to make it less, Right? And we talk about that all the time. You can come to God at any point. He loves you too much. Anything you've done in your life cannot decrease the God, God's love. But the inverse is also true. There is nothing that you can do in your life to increase God's love, to increase God's favor for you. This is good news. This is great. Jesus actually talked about this in a parable. Uh, the parable of the lost sons. The parable of the lost sons. Yes, I said sons intentionally. <laughs> Both sons are lost in that parable. The younger son believes that he's wrecked his relationship with the father. Oh, dad's never going to me, want me back unless I come to him as a hired son, as a hired servant. I can't be part of the family anymore. I've messed up too big. I've messed up too big. There's no way he's going to love me. And he comes to the father and he repents and then the father embraces him. Doesn't even get a chance for him to say, I just want to be your hired servant. Don't even take me on as a son. The father overwhelms him and grabs him, puts the ring on it, the family ring on his finger, robe on his back and says, you, my son's back. He's in, right? The younger son could not decrease the love that the father had for him. But the older son, he actually had the same problem. You see, the younger son believed that the father was taxing and demanding and that the only way he could come back is if if he came back as a hired servant. The older son believed the same thing. The father is taxing and demanding and I need to stay with him and grind and grind and grind and live the life of a slave if I want any ounce of love for him. How do we know that? Because the, fa- because the older son admits it. When the, fa- when the older son hears that there's a party being thrown for the younger son, he's like, what? He, what? 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 
How dare God, how dare the father love this guy? He's betrayed him, he stabbed him in the back. And the father comes to him and says, come join the party, this is for you too. And the older son's like, no way, I have been slaving for you for years and you haven't even so much as given me a goat to celebrate with my friends and that's the problem. He didn't wanna celebrate with the father. <laughs> he thought he could earn some perks for himself to celebrate on his own. He didn't want the father to be p part of the picture because he thought he could earn the father's favor. He thought he could earn the father's love. And the father's response to him is the exact same response he gives to the younger son. My son, <laughs> I love you. Everything I have is already yours. This party is just as much for you as it is for him. Come, come join. What was lost has been found and the story is left open-ended. We don't know what the older son does with that information. There is nothing we can do to change God's love for us. You can't get more of it. You can't get less of it. He loves you so much, his son died on a cross to pay for your sins and for my sins. He loves you with an overwhelming love as it talks about in Romans 8. It's this love that nothing can separate. Nothing can get in the way. You see, what Peter needed was healing from that. And then the impure and pure stuff started falling into place. He needed to recognize, wow, I can't earn more of God's love. And at the end of the day, well, that's what the impure, pure stuff was all about. Believe, the Jews believing they could earn more of God's love if they lived life that way. You see, we're left with a question in this story, right? We're left with a question. Do you think that God, that, your, that our actions can impact God's love? Do you believe that your actions can change God's love for you? And if you do, I have good news for you. They can't. And there is an incredible amount of freedom when you can live in that space. God loves me so much, I can't decrease it and I can't increase it. There's nothing that I can do to make up for my sin. There's nothing I can do to make him love me anymore. And there's this incredible freedom that happens when we can embrace that. Peter found freedom on this day because he embraced the truth that God does not show favoritism. That he can't earn any more of God's love. He's got access to all of it. Now, we don't know why Peter developed that. <laughs> we don't know what caused it, per se. We get hints through scriptures, through scripture. I believe, I, I think a big part of it was probably the day that when Jesus was executed, right? And tried unfairly, and, and Peter denied Jesus three times. That probably didn't help. Left a weight of guilt on his shoulders. Whoa, I gotta make up for that. I gotta show Jesus I'm committed, right? I'm sure that weighed heavy on him, but we don't know what else transpired in their family. To add to, the, to add to that, to make him think that he had to earn more of God's favor? We don't know. We don't know. But I do know that it was a process. And it was a process that extended beyond Acts chapter 10. You see, Acts chapter 10 happens, but then there's an interesting story in the book of Galatians <laughs> where Peter goes and visits a church in Antioch, which we read about in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, the church of Antioch booms and explodes. And so Peter, after the uh, council of Jerusalem, in which we read about in Acts chapter 15, decides to go visit the church in Antioch. And we know this because Paul records it in the book of Galatians. And, and Peter was doing great interacting with the Gentiles, like embracing, like embracing them as fellow brothers and sisters. Everything was good until some Jewish Christians showed up. And the second some Jewish Christians some showed up, boom, Peter went right back to cutting off the Gentiles and going back to the Jews. And he severed off all connection. And Paul calls him on it. He says, what are you doing, man? We were called to freedom. These are your fellow brothers and sisters. You don't do this. And he even says, like, Peter managed to, like, sway Barnabas. Barnabas went too. It, well, Peter was a long time working this through. He embraced the truth, but then our sin, when we're captive to it, has ripples that we need to deal with. <laughs> and sometimes it's gonna take other people speaking into our lives to deal with those ripples, as Paul had to do for Peter. Or we might need more visions and, 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 more, and more scripture to be able to help us fix the, 
bad things that we're believing about God and ourselves. But I think Peter, by the end of his life, got it right. I think he, I think he found complete healing here on earth from that because of his epistles that he writes. First and second Peter were likely written near the end of his life and he writes them to Gentiles he has never met and he calls them fellow brothers and sisters and he has some incredible exhortations for them. He, it's something that he probably would have written to his best friend <laughs> and uh, calls them to persevere in the faith. I think by the end he got it and God had to, but God had to continually work and continually adjust and continually speak. It's why learning to discern the voice of God is so critical, so critical. It's why, it's why we're, as a denomination, as a side note, as a denomination, we're, we're running the Set Free Retreat again because there are things, it's an incredible tool to allow you to work on maybe the next thing that God wants to work on in your healing journey to help you find and discover healing, the next thing that you need to do. I've now been twice, and I've been to many other retreats that are very similar to it, and every time I've met with God and he's adjusted one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. So I really encourage you, if you're on the fence at all, I strongly, strongly encourage you, take advantage of this opportunity. Take advantage of this opportunity because you don't know what the next healing step might be unless you're willing to engage with God and hear what he has to say. If you want to know more, talk to Pastor Randy or myself or somebody else on leadership who's been to Set Free. We'd love to help support you in making that decision one way or the other. So where does that leave us? I think that leaves us in with a big question. What's in process of being healed? For Peter, it's this understanding about God, that he doesn't show favoritism, that he can't make God love him more. What about the rest of us? What is God working on? What is he trying to heal in your life? What are, what are those things that maybe you think, okay, I've dealt with this, and it seems to just keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. There's a chance that maybe the, there's something else. You're not completely free yet, and that's okay because that's everybody's story. We're all there. We're all there. God's power heals us, and that power is manifest through communication. Prayer is significant. Prayer is important. Prayer gives us access to the healing power of God. Do you know how to pray? Do you know how to pray? Do you know what God wants to work on in your life and in mine? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. And even in this moment where things are a little quieter, we trust that even now there might be something you're impressing upon us, on each one of us, something that you want to adjust, something that you want to embrace in response to the truth that we've heard today. And Father, I pray that whatever that is, you will make it abundantly clear to us that we won't, that it'll be this thing that we just can't escape, that it'll nag and nag and bother us until we finally, finally face it and encounter your power, encounter your healing, encounter your truth that can set us free. We're so grateful that you are an active God that you are a faithful God, Lord. This is the reason why it's so critical, Lord, that we develop so many, the, the ability to discern your voice in all of its expressions. Because you are a faithful God, you are the rock. You are consistent in character and you are consistent in the truth you communicate. And we just pray that that truth will be abundantly clear in the week to come that you will put scripture in our laps that will affirm the truth we need to hear, that you will put people on our paths who will carry the messages we need to hear, that your spirit will continue to speak and dialogue with us as we speak and dialogue with you. Father, we thank you that you are so good, that you are so great, and we are so appreciative for your grace that is willing to, to, work in the long, to work the long game. He doesn't give up on us, 
but is willing to change and mold and shape us by degrees. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.